morning, everyone. Welcome you to our first service this morning, our 8 o'clock service. The order of service is printed for you in your service folder. Our opening hymn in a few moments is going to be hymn 768. The usual stuff is found in your service folder, the connect card, as well as the message notes. Also included this week is the quarterly financial statement. If you have any questions about that, feel free to catch me after church. Beyond that, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. May God bless our time in his word. stand. We continue this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today our Lord encourages us to live with courage and hope. May his word encourage us, for we are never truly alone. May his gospel empower us to live boldly and confidently in grace and with grace. We ask this in the name of the risen and ascended Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today, we come before the true God because of his mercy to us in Christ. Lord of life, I confess that I have sinned against you. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts, words, and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask for your forgiveness. Deliver and restore me, that I may rest this night in peace. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We live now in peace and rise each new day to serve him. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 735. Speak, O Lord, hymn 735.
first scripture lesson for today comes to us from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Here we see Moses quite scared of failing. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, so is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored, like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you, or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their, mouth, their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson for today comes to us from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Here, Paul encourages Timothy to proclaim faithfully and boldly the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I remember, or I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This again is the word of the Lord. 
Having heard the word which brings faith, we now join in confessing that faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's printed for you on page 6. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 556, hymn 556. to peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the name of that Christ. A few minutes ago we read that lesson from Exodus and on the one hand it might feel a little jarring to have ended on the verse that we did. Lord, please send someone else. But Moses there illustrates something important. Moses was highly trained. He, he spent the first part of his life growing up and being educated in the court of Pharaoh. But he was scared. He was afraid of failing, being rejected, falling flat on his face. It's a fear that a lot of us human beings have. It's a fear that keeps some from 
trying at all. And interestingly enough, fear of failure also can serve as an interesting surface driver for some people who appear very, very driven. Fear of failure is, is something that, again, is, is a common thing among us human beings. In our gospel lesson, we see something interesting. Our text for today from Matthew 28, verses 16 and following, we read it briefly here, the first part of the text, and then just little snippets of 19 and 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus tells the disciples, go. That great commission, right? The great commission to the church, go. And he also further promises that he's going to be with them. But there's that word hanging there at the end of verse 17. Doubted. What were they doubting? That he was who he says he was? That he was alive? Probably not those two things. In Luke 24, we're reminded again, Easter evening, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look, and my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus, for the last 40 days, for a month plus, has been spending time with the disciples appearing to them multiple times, staying with them for extended periods of time, showing them over and over and over again that he's very much who he says he is. He's the Jesus that they knew from before his crucifixion and that he's not a ghost. He's not just a spirit walking around. So it's probably not that. So what? What about that word doubt? What were they doubting? It seems entirely plausible that as Jesus is teaching them, again, these 40 days, Jesus is prepping them for his ascension. He's telling them all kinds of different things and teaching them all kinds of different things to get them ready for that time when he's no longer going to be walking around in the world. And as that moment draws nigh, some of the disciples are maybe starting to wonder, can we actually do this without him? Can we actually keep this train going? Can we actually keep this ship moving? Is this movement going to completely fall apart once Jesus is no longer with us here physically, bodily on earth? Can we do this? And it wouldn't shock me in the slightest if some of them weren't at all sure that this was possible. They doubted that they were going to be able to do it. They doubted that they were going to be able to carry out the work that Jesus was calling them to do without Jesus actually physically there with them. And that's even though Jesus both says go and equips them. He gives them tools and a promise. He gives them directions. Go, baptize, teach. Use the tools I've given you, the gospel, the means of grace, and word and sacrament. And then I'm going to be with you. I'm not actually going to leave you alone. But they're still unsure. The Bible has some things to say about this, doubt. But one of the things we want to focus on here as we're looking at the text is just 
the reality that a heart at rest doesn't avoid or chase ghosts of the past, present, or future. What do I mean by that? <laughs> the heart that is at rest in Jesus the heart that is at rest in God and knows what God has done and is confident in God's love neither freezes nor chases. Remember what I said. When it comes to fear of failure, what I said at the beginning, when it comes to failure, people, we think more commonly, just avoid trying. That's one thing that people do. They avoid trying when they're scared of failure. And, and, and they won't step out. They, they, they won't give it a, they give it a shot. They, uh, maybe somebody else can do this, but not me, Lord. And, and whatever that thing is, whatever that thing is that the person either feels unqualified for, ill-equipped for, or, or, or scared to do, lest they run out of the proverbial trench and nobody follows. or really try really hard and put in a lot of effort and time and energy and it completely blows up or completely fizzles. But as I said, there's another, there's another reaction that some people to have when they're scared of failure is they compensate in the other direction and they push and push and push and push they're motivated by fear fear of failing fear of looking like a failure fear of appearing to others to be a failure and so they push and push and push themselves or others to be as successful or as outwardly put together or as accomplished as possible but the motivation either way is the same. It's fear. Uh, parents sometimes can fall into this. They, they maybe have a bad experience as a child, a brutal interpersonal relationship. Maybe they were bullied. And they are determined as adults to make sure that their kids are never, ever bullied. And so they push their kids to be successful, to appear successful, to, 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 to get good grades, to, to never... Parents, please be careful <laughs> that you don't... If you're motivated by fear, you're going to teach your kids to motivate, be motivated by fear. And if they learn to be motivated by fear, they're going to spend their life living in fear which is not fun. Don't teach your kids to live in fear. So scared of even a minor failure that they, 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 they have chronic anxiety at the littlest of things. A heart at rest doesn't do that, though. A heart at rest in Jesus doesn't avoid and, and, and not try ever nor does it chase ghosts. Ghosts of past pain or possible future pain. Again, the Bible has some things to say about this. Way back in the beginning, we see someone who was ashamed of a failure and hid our forefather Adam. He answered, that is Adam, I heard you in the garden, I was afraid. The, the, the because I was naked was a deflection, although it was a reflection of how he felt now that he realized what he had done. So he hid. Failure hurts. It can really, really hurt. And it can cause people to just run and hide, which is why Jude or, or other places we could see in the Bible too. But Jude puts it very nice and simply. Be merciful to those who doubt. Be kind. If somebody's struggling, if somebody's really unsure, if somebody isn't... Uh, be kind. Be merciful. Be patient. 
patiently encourage, patiently bring them along, uh, maybe as a practical matter. If somebody is really struggling with fear of failure, maybe as a parent, what you do with a kid is you give them something that should be easy for them to accomplish so that they can see that little success and not see that everything is doomed to failure. We, we can do that with each other as adults too. Easy wins. Psalm 118, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? This verse gives us some important perspective and it's a verse that would have given the disciples in our text some important perspective. Give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. He is good. His love endures. Whether Jesus was walking with them bodily as they had gotten used to for three years or whether he was ascended to the right hand of the Father, his love for them would continue to endure. And the Lord is with me. Jesus promised to the disciples at the end, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. Or as Paul would write in another place, if God is for us, who can be against us? Which is why I think Paul maybe had this psalm in mind when he wrote those words in Romans 8. What can mere mortals do to me? If you remember who you are in Jesus and God's love and his promise and his presence and his grace and his mercy and his compassion for you, if your heart is at rest in that, well, what can anybody else do to you? What's the worst that can happen? You try and it doesn't work. Okay. And that's okay. Not every plan it needs to succeed. Not every plan will succeed. There are a number of good plans that don't succeed. But that's okay because the Lord is the Lord. The Lord is the Lord of the universe. And He doesn't fail. And connected to him, connected to his grace, connected to his mercy, neither will you. Now, let me explain that. I'm not saying that connected to Jesus, everything you will touch will be, quote-unquote, like Midas, turned to gold and be awesome. But connected to Christ, you will never fail to have peace. Connected to Christ and his means of grace, connected to his gospel, reminded of his love and compassion for you, you will never fail to have hope. And even in the face of struggle and hardship, you'll find yourself with a spiritually infused courage and confidence. Rest in Jesus and you, can, you cannot fail to have peace, Hope, courage, confidence, joy. These are things the scriptures promise. Jesus knew what it was to struggle. And he reminds us of something that he would teach us in the Lord's Prayer. And something that actually can give us some freedom and peace when it comes to trying and to failure and to stepping out. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, not as I will, but as you will. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Jesus is our Savior understands what it feels like to be unsure, to be fearful. Jesus is our Savior, took our sin on himself on the cross and did carry out that plan. And he also reminds us of something. God's will will be done. God's will will be accomplished. Sometimes, wonderfully, through what we do, which is a fun thing. 
when the good things of God are done through us, that can be a really fun thing to experience, to see God's grace in action through the things we try and through the, the efforts we go about doing, through, to see the light bulb of faith go off in somebody that you've been talking to for weeks or months or even years, to see the Spirit work through that and for new peace and joy to flood into their heart, to see that as a wonderful thing, to... to Stand like we did last year, about a year ago, as literally hundreds and hundreds of people drove by to, for trunk or treat, but in the process of also saying hello and, 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 and giving them a bag with candy, we're also sharing the gospel and giving them things to encourage them in their walk of faith with Christ. These are fun things to see. But, but even if things we try flop, God is still in charge and his will will be done and the things he wants done will be accomplished. And that is a both comforting and freeing thing. It can actually be, like I said, a comforting and freeing thing that can take our fear away to actually try or can motivate us to try without fear. God's will is going to be done. What he wants done will be done. The Bible says this over and over and over again. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is in control. He's in charge. What he purposes will be accomplished. What he desires will happen. Or, first Isaiah 55. We'll go there first. So it is, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word is going to get done what it needs to get done. God's word is going to accomplish what the Lord wants it to accomplish. Romans 8, 28, God is in control. The Jesus who all authority in heaven and on earth flows through, that Jesus is working out all things for our good. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He does. We know that in all things, God is working for the eternal good of his church. We know that in all things, God is working for the good of his gospel. And what God wants done will be done. And so that's why Paul can write in 1 Corinthians 3.10. For the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. That's okay. To not be the one that sees the fruit is okay. To not be the one that sees the results is Okay. We go about what God has called us to do faithfully, that is share the gospel and word and sacrament, and then we let God take care of things in his timetable. And sometimes we're going to see it, and it's going to be incredible. And sometimes we may not see it right away, and that's okay, because God is in charge, and God is going to get done what he wants done. We don't need to be afraid of failure because God will not let his church fail. We don't need to be afraid of failure because Jesus is always with us even to the very end of the age. We don't need to be afraid of failure because God has equipped us with powerful, powerful tools, word and sacrament. We don't need to be afraid of failure Because in the end, you're loved. And whether we outwardly succeed or not, God will still love you. His love and grace and compassion is not contingent, dependent on your performance. In Bible class in a little bit, we're going to be talking about how it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works. Grace saves you. Grace frees you from fear. Grace can empower you to step out and try. 
And grace can give you peace even if those efforts don't always bear the kind of earthly fruit we hope for. You don't need to be afraid, afraid of failure because God won't fail you and his church under his hand will never fail or fall. Let's pray. Please stand. Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We ask that you would guide our steps by the light of your word. We ask that you would shield us from harm and keep us from evil. We ask that your grace, mercy, and compassion would continue to flow over us. Guide our steps again by the light of your word. Help us to remember the promises you give. Help us to find peace and hope and joy and the reality that your word does not return empty. It will accomplish what you desire. That your church will stand. Your gospel will be proclaimed and we through faith in you will see your face in glory. Comfort us, encourage us, give us boldness and confidence. Help us to face the challenges of this life with courage, knowing that you are with us. That you will never leave us or forsake us. Make your church bold here and throughout the world to carry out your mission. Make your church confident and courageous here and throughout the world that it faithfully shares your gospel with souls who need salvation. Souls that need comforting. Souls that need compassion and mercy. Watch over all of us today. Bless our time here and bless our week to come. In your holy name we pray and join in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue now with our next hymn, hymn 439, hymn 439.
stand for the closing prayer and blessing. Eternal Lord of life, through your Son you have given your people the brightness of your light. Kindle in our hearts and minds a holy desire to shine with the brightness of Christ rising until we feast at the banquet of eternal light through Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you today and always. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll conclude our service with our final hymn, hymn 579, hymn 579. Once again, good morning, everyone. God's blessings on your week. A um, couple of quick announcements. And then because I completely spaced out and forgot Wells Connection, we'll drop that in here um, at the end. Before we get to that, though, announcements, again, usual places. In the moment, up on the screen in your service folder and online. Um, two other things. One is that um, you're reminded that uh, phase four feedback for um, what is listed there on the sheet. So they were in the bulletin last week. They've been um, emailed out to the congregation. There's some extras over there on the shelf there next to the keyboard. Just to let us know kind of what you're thinking as far as a seating, as far as um, chairs or pews and pads and stuff. We'd like to have those back by the 17th um, so that we can have something in hand for the council to consider at their next meeting. Um, and then also, um, just a reminder too that uh, Trunk or Treat um, is the end of the month. We're going to be doing as we did last year with a drive through That seemed to work really, really well. If you'd like to help out in any way, please let me or Deb know. Um, and also, um, if you're willing, um, please consider uh, supporting that either with a free will offering in the um, little offering box there in the entryway next to the bigger one or, or by donating something like a bag of candy. Thank you again for everything. Um, if you have any questions, as always, feel free to catch me after church. We'll check out this month's Wells Connection now, since again, I forgot it, and then go about our day.
Hello, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. It's important for every Wells member to know that there's a shortage of pastors, teachers, and staff ministers in our Synod with vacant positions all across the country. That means all of us need to do more to encourage young people to consider full-time ministry. And a key part of that effort is ensuring a first-class campus experience at Martin Luther College. Students like Caitlin Butler have a lot of options when considering which college to attend. They look at the coursework, the social atmosphere, and even athletic facilities. It's also nice that we not only get to grow in our faith together, but we also get to um, enjoy some of the other things that we like doing, like sports. Martin Luther College's sports facilities, residence halls, and other buildings have not kept pace with similar schools. And even though Caitlin enrolled at MLC, Many of her friends looked elsewhere for their college education, an unfortunate reality that has hurt Martin Luther College's enrollment. You can definitely tell that there's a lot of outdated stuff, and coming from some of my other friends who are at other colleges, you can, you can uh, definitely tell there's a lot of differences uh, between the facilities here at MLC compared to other places. But that's about to change. MLC is building a large indoor practice facility Many generous gifts laid the financial foundation, and a transformational gift enabled construction to begin. The Betty Cohn Field House features a large artificial turf practice area, batting cages, golf simulators, and locker rooms. This building is going to help our campus recruit and retain uh, those who are going to one day be pastors and teachers and staff ministers. A new residence hall is also in the planning stages. It's part of a larger plan to ensure Martin Luther College nurtures all the gifts of our young people, from musical talent to science skills to leadership skills that flow from on-the-field competition. We simply must provide a campus that speaks to the prospective students of the 21st century. The campaign seeking to jumpstart this campus upgrade is called Equipping Christian Witnesses. It reflects a recognition that we need to support and encourage the promising young people who will lead our church in the future. It makes sense that we as a church body would, would devote a lot of resources and energy to training future gospel ambassadors. Another key aspect of the campaign is increasing financial aid for students so that no one sees the cost of MLC as a roadblock to public ministry. If we can build our financial aid, we can make sure that finances do not stop anyone from pursuing ministry, and especially those who just aren't quite sure and maybe now too easily can look another direction when God's given them those gifts. It's a blessing every time a young person takes a step toward a future in public ministry. Our role is to do all we can to encourage them and to help provide the top flight college experience that demonstrates our love for our students and for people who need to hear about our Savior. Construction on the new Betty Cohn Fieldhouse at Martin Luther College is well underway, and it should be ready for use in just a couple of months. If you would like to follow the construction and participate in the effort, go to the website on your screen or contact our Wells Ministry of Christian Giving at 800-827-5482. Thank you again for being here today. Be well, be safe, and Lord willing, we'll see you again really soon.